Good morning. Welcome to uh, this morning's webinar, Nature's Architect, about the American beaver. Um, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of fun stuff in just a minute about how beavers uh, build their homes and when are they active and um, all sorts of fun facts that Kaylin has planned for us shortly. I just want to let you know that um, if you enjoy today's webinar, I hope you join us for some of our future webinars. Next week we are covering Ohio's woodpeckers. Um, so that's going to be on the 27th at 10 a.m. And then we have a bunch of fun webinars planned for February. Um, hibernation, fascination. We have one on, on bobcats and maple syrup production. And then we also have some fascinating ones um, about uh, celebrating Black History Month. So we hope you keep an eye out for our webinars. They'll be posted on our Facebook page. And all of them are recorded and put on our YouTube page um, if you want to go back and watch. So helping me today with questions, which if you have any, uh, please put them in the Q&A box and we will do our best to answer all of your questions. Uh, I have Lauren Stewart from Mommy Bay State Park and I have Julie Gee. Julie is going to be presenting next week. Um, Julie is from Burr Oak State Park and I'm going to welcome our presenter, Kaylin Callender from Lake Hope State Park. And she's going to be, oh, there you are, Kaylin. <laughs> she's going to be giving uh, the presentation today. So go ahead and take it away, Kaylin. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, like Alyssa said, we're going to be talking about the American beaver. And uh, normally when I do this program, this time of year, we're out hiking around. Um, but you guys get to watch a little bit and learn a little bit about beaver from the comfort of your own homes. Um, just know that Lake Hope is a great place to find American beaver. I'll be sharing with you a couple pictures from some activity that I've seen recently in the park. So if you do get the opportunity to come out to Lake Hope or to any of the other state parks, um, please do so because there's quite a few that have beaver activity in them. So to get started, in case you're not familiar with the American beaver, I happen to have a friend here with me that's going to help me point out some of their adaptations. They have physical adaptations, <clears throat> which are parts of their body that help them survive and thrive in their environment. And then they also have some behavioral adaptations um, that are going to help them also thrive, but it's more like things that they do as opposed to parts of their body. So let's take a look at my little friend here. Now he's actually not so little. I'm going to have you look at him and not me. Can everybody see that? All right, so uh, this is the American beaver and the American beaver is actually the largest North American rodent. Uh, they are up to four and a half feet long and they can get up to an average of 90 pounds. And there was actually a record of a 115 pound beaver uh, in North America as well. So they're very large creatures. This one is kind of mid range that I have here, <clears throat> but I have seen some at Lake Hope that are a little on the, uh, the heavier side. So we're gonna start with the head here. As you can see, they have a really uh, short, stout, thick head. Uh, and we'll talk about the, the skull in just a minute. Um, but the, the nose and the ears here are fairly small and both of them have a valve that closes up when they go underwater. So in case you're not familiar again with the beaver, they are a semi-aquatic mammal, which means they spend quite a bit of time in the water but they are not spending all of their time in the water. So they need these adaptations to help them spend that time under there. So they can close up their nose and their ears and then their eyes are fairly small as well. And they have what's called a nictitating membrane or a third eyelid, which closes over their eye and actually helps them to see really well below the water 
and also protects that eye. Um, and then when they're above water, they can see just OK, so they have better eyesight when they're submerged. And then I think the, in, the most interesting part about the, the face itself is the lips that close behind the teeth. Now I'm going to kind of move him back here and we're going to talk a little bit about the skull. You guys see that really large incisors here on the front. So when I talk about the lips closing behind the skull, they're kind of closing in right here, or closing behind the incisors. They're closing in right here. And that's because when they're submerged, they might be chewing on vegetation. And so they need those lips to close to seal in uh, any of the water that might get into their mouth. So when their lips close back here, they can still keep chewing. Also, their tongue is sort of raised inside of their mouth so that they can also close up their airway as well if they need their lips open underwater. So it's kind of a two part fail safe um, if they're submerged. Now the teeth themselves, look how yellow they are. They're like really orange. Does anybody know why? I will tell you. It's because they don't brush their teeth. <laughs> no, actually on the front of the incisors is a really, really thick, uh, very hard enamel. And so, uh, what happens is when they're chewing on trees and vegetation, the enamel wears away slower on the front than it does on the back side of the teeth. So if I turn this, hopefully you can see that it, it becomes almost a chisel shape in there because the, the back is wearing out quicker than the front, which is great for beaver because they chew on trees. Now this is also a good thing because in the rodent family, what happens is they are constantly growing their teeth. So if they're not chewing on really hard items like trees, their teeth start growing up and around and back into their skull and that can cause some issues for the beaver. They wouldn't be able to open or close correctly and certainly they wouldn't be able to eat anything. So it is good that they keep filing away at these uh, ever growing teeth. Now, if you can see the back molars here, uh, they're very flat and that's also to help grind vegetation. So this is a pretty thick, pretty stout skull that the beavers have here. Now, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is uh, the body itself. They're kind of chubby kind of fat, uh, especially when we get later into the season, into the fall. They're packing on some fat, which we'll talk about particularly where that fat goes in just a minute. Um, but the fur itself is really important for beaver. And I have another pelt right here to show you guys a little closer up. Subaquatic mammals have a, a two layer system of fur. The, the first part are these longer guard hairs, the really shiny ones that you can see. And those are wicking moisture away from the beaver's body. So it's keeping it uh, nice and dry when it's submerged. And that's really important, especially this time of year when it's so cold outside, they're still going underwater and they're still getting wet. The other part is if you if you kind of move all those guard hairs back, you can see the soft, fluffier layer underneath, and hopefully you can see that it's a little crimpy, a little curly. So if you did your hair in the 90s, you know what crimping is. <laughs> it's really wavy. That's kind of what they have going on down there, and that structure of that really thick sublayer of fur is going to help them stay nice and warm. Again, really important when you are swimming underneath the ice in January, February, uh, while you're out there. So they have a nice thick two-part system 
And if you've been following our winter hike series lately, you might have seen uh, some of the naturalists talking about how you should prepare for your hikes during the winter by layering. So this is exactly what you should be doing is a nice uh, insulating layer underneath followed by a nice waterproof shell on top. So you can dress like the beaver and stay nice and warm for your winter hikes. <clears throat> All right, so the rest of the body, um, let's talk really quickly about inside the body here. The beaver has enlarged lungs and an enlarged liver, and that's going to help them maximize the oxygen in their body so that they can stay underwater for up to 15 minutes. So they are holding their breath, but they also have the ability to hold in a lot more air than we do. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next thing that I want to talk about is their feet. Let me pull up this little print right here. Now they do have four feet. They have two in the front, uh, which are not webbed. And then the hind feet are webbed really heavily. Now this helps in a couple different ways. Of course, creatures with this adaptation are able to swim really well. It acts as flippers, but it also helps them just like snowshoes on the mud. So as their feet and claws fan out with the webbing in there, they're not sinking down onto the mud as easily. And they are in some really muddy situations out there in the wetlands. They do have five claws on their feet. Uh, and on the hind feet, the innermost claws are actually a combed structure. So this is going to help the beaver to um, be able to, I'll use the word preen or groom itself so uh, that it can release parasites or um, clean its fur as it uh, combs itself with its hind legs. So that's another really interesting adaptation as far as the feet are concerned. Now again, if you are familiar with a beaver, you are gonna know the very characteristic tail, the big flat wide tail that we have turn it around here so you can see it a little bit better. They do have a really flat tail. It is a, a horizontal structure as opposed to an up and down vertical structure like uh, let's say a muskrat for example. Theirs will be flipped the other way. Now this tail is helping the beaver in lots of different ways. First of all because again they're a swimmer it does act as a rudder and a propeller when they're underwater. When they're cutting trees down with those big incisors we talked about, it's acting as a support. So they're kind of leaning back perhaps if they're trying to reach up a little bit higher. And then also when they're on land, it's helping them to balance. They're really kind of clumsy when they're on land. They're much, much more graceful in the water. They're built more for the water. But when they're walking around, that tail is going to help them balance. And then, uh, of course, you have the warning slaps with the tail. So uh, especially in the summertime when I have um, a full moon hike that goes around the lake, Almost always we will hear beaver slapping this tail against the surface of the water. So that sound is creating a warning signal for the rest of its colony saying, hey, there is something not quite right going on here. Uh, we should be aware of it. Everybody dive, 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 that kind of thing. The last thing that the tail helps the beaver to do is um, fat storage and thermoregulation. So when they're building up fat storage for the winter, because they're not getting a lot of fresh vegetation, uh, this is where most of that fat is going to go, is right into the tail. And then it will slowly sort of um, 
feed out into the body as the winter continues and you'll get a, a, a thinner and thinner tail as we get closer to the springtime. And of course, thermoregulation just simply means that uh, the tail is able to regulate the body temperature so that the beaver doesn't get too hot, for example, in the summertime. Um, because there is no real fur, not a lot of fur on this tail, that is helping um, the hot body temperature to, to uh, lower if they're um, getting a little too warm. I do have a real tail here. Um, these are really hard to preserve, but I do have one to show you guys. Uh, it does have, like I said, just a little bit of fur, really some coarse hairs on there. Um, and it's mostly scaled, almost like a fish. So uh, it's a really interesting structure, especially on a mammal, to see that tail up close. So hopefully that's not too blurry for you guys. All right. So I'm going to turn yeah. me. And we're going to talk uh, a little bit more about some of the behaviors that they have. Um, and I do also find the history really interesting of the American beaver here in North America, uh, as well as worldwide, another type of beaver. So I'm going to switch over to my PowerPoint. All right, so you guys should be able to see that. So we've already talked a little bit about the description of the beaver, the physical description of it. Again, like I said, we're going to talk about the history uh, and the significant role that they played in North America. Uh, of course, we'll talk about uh, the range and habitat, some of the behaviors, and then a few more particulars after that. The first slide I have here is of that lip that's closing behind the teeth. This is a really fun uh, photo that I found and I thought it might give you a little better idea of what I was talking about <laughs> with my fingers in the skull. So, so that is again those incisors with the, the lip closing behind it when they go underwater. And of course you can see uh, a photo that we have here of uh, beaver itself. So we're going to actually start the American beaver story in Europe and Asia, which is kind of interesting, a little strange. Um, but prior to the 1800s, or excuse me, at least the 1600s, I should say, um, there was a really big global fur trade going on uh, in Europe and Asia. Um, and it had a, a lot of countries playing into it. The major um, countries that were contributing to the fur trade at the time were Russia, the northern Scandinavian countries, so you're talking Norway, Sweden, Finland, um, and then also Central Asia. And some of the fur trade uh, was not just the Eurasian beaver, which what, is what we're talking about when we go over into that part of the world, but we're also talking about uh, wolf furs, we're talking about reindeer or our caribou, um, and, and some of the other really thick, more luxurious furs that uh, the species that they have in that part of the world. So it was a big deal. Um, now, the furs that they uh, were trading, there was sort of three different methods to use these furs. First, you have the full pelt, which is the fur and the skin. Then you have that leather or suede product, which uh, is just the skin with all the fur removed. And then finally, you have the felt product, which is the fur with no skin. And that's the one that they were using the beaver particularly for. Um, this felting process where you are taking that fur and applying heat and pressure to form a material. Now, a lot of times, um, excuse me, I should say that uh, this, this particular process of felting um, was really, really 
monopolized by Russia for a long period of time. Um, they were really good at it. They had a, a trade secret of how to comb the guard hairs from that sub layer of fur so that they would get a really, really nice product and they, they weren't telling anybody how they were doing it. So there was a lot of importing of poor quality furs and exporting this felt product for a, a really big profit, which was um, quite interesting. Now, in particular with the beaver, the Eurasian beaver and also the American beaver when we get over into North America, their fur was valuable, of course, but also the castor or that musky oil that they secrete from underneath their tail, um, that was also prized for medicinal uses as well. So um, you can also eat beaver as well. So the trappers were using uh, the beaver for multiple different reasons, not just necessarily the fur. So I wanted to make that clear too. Uh, the beaver fur in particular, the, the physical structure of it, um, as far as the felting process goes, made it really, um, uh, made that process really easy because it was uh, the keratin that that fur is made out of. It, um, it kind of fans out on those different little tiny hairs. And so it's able to really grab a hold of each other and, and make that material possible. So with that felting process, one of the main things that was uh, being created from that beaver felt were hats. And this was a really fun graphic that I found. Lots of different kinds of hats there. Um, these hats were really expensive. Like I said, Russia sort of monopolized that felting process because they had some trade secrets. Um, so when they were exporting out of the country, the, the felt, it was, it was hard to come by. So you needed to have some money in order to um, get one of these hats. And the, the hat was this status symbol. It was a status of wealth, um, where you were in society, perhaps your job. So you can see uh, some of these automatically you're thinking military or you're thinking dignitary or if, for example, you're looking at the bottom right hand corner there, the top hat you know, um, Abraham Lincoln ha was famous for his top hat. Now his wasn't made out of beaver felt, unfortunately. I, I did double check that one. His was made out of silk, but he would be somebody that could pull a beaver hat off for sure. So what was happening with the Eurasian beaver in Europe and Asia was that it was being trapped to near extinction by the 17th century. There was only about 1,200 of them left by some estimates. Um, and unfortunately, this coincided with exploration in the New World here over in North America. So in the 1600s, uh, these European colonies were coming over to North America and they were finding the American beaver. And the physical characteristics of the Eurasian beaver versus the American beaver, they look pretty much exactly the same. The fur is pretty much the same with some color differences. Um, so they were really, really excited because there wasn't a whole lot of the other beaver where they came from. And now, boom, there's a ton of them here. 60 million. Uh, by some estimates in North America of the American beaver. So the French, the Dutch, the English, they all started to try and find ways to work with the Native American population over here um, because they were very familiar with hunting and trapping skill sets um, for these beaver. And uh, so they were, they were trying to expand those accesses to that resource. Um, you know, this, 
this is a, a kind of a touchy subject, I suppose. And of course, there's much more detail about all of these relationships, but there was um, a give and take going on and the Native Americans and the European colonists, they did both benefit for a period of time, not only with the beaver, um, but also economic exchange for other goods uh, as well. Unfortunately, we all know how that kind of ended uh, or is still going on, I should say, too. Um, that competition led to a lot of warfare. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately, the American beaver started to be extirpated from its range as well. So historically speaking, prior to the European colonization in North America, uh, the American beaver could be found almost through the entire North American continent, all the way up through Canada into Northern Canada, where you start to get into that tundra. That's where that line kind of ends because of course there's no trees up there. And then if you go down into the Southwest where you get more of a desert environment, beaver are not found there either. As far as Ohio goes, um, they were historically found throughout the whole entire state. This particular graphic right here uh, in the middle of Ohio is from 2012 um, from Division of Wildlife and it's indicating that most of the beaver, uh, and this is still relatively true up until this point in time, most of the beaver here in Ohio are going to be found in the eastern part of the state and also the southeastern part. So that black is where there's more higher density. And then the gray is, is more of a medium density and then of course less and less. So you can find them in all of the counties, just not as abundantly as you would find in any of the counties highlighted in black. Now, unfortunately, um, due to unregulated trapping and hunting in Ohio in particular, the beaver was extirpated uh, by about 1830. Extirpated just simply means that it was hunted or trapped completely out of the state. You couldn't find them in Ohio, but you could find them in other parts of their range. So they weren't um, they weren't uh, completely gone. There was not an extinction happening, but they were extirpated. And then thankfully, uh, by the 1930s, beaver started coming back into the state um, and recolonizing it. So that is the good news. And as you can see with the graphic on the right hand side, the line graph there, it starts in 1960 and goes up through 19, excuse me, 2019. Um, and it's simply indicating that that population has slowly grown throughout the years. And then in the last 20 years or so, it's been relatively stable. What you're seeing on those last 20 years on this line graph here, uh, it looks like a big fluctuation, um, but that fluctuation most likely indicates some changes in the survey methods that Division of Wildlife uh, has been doing for the beaver population here in Ohio. So let's talk a little bit about that. So the latest data that I found um, for Division of Wildlife was their 2019 aerial survey. They uh, surveyed 54 different 25 mile uh, plots and determined that there was an estimation in Ohio of about 4700 colonies or families and then uh, about 28,000 individual beavers. <clears throat> now this was at the end of 2019 in November I believe so so this is only maybe just a little more than a year old, so fairly new information. Now, what I found fascinating was because the, the habitat that they were in, these colonies were located in uh, several different types of habitats. Most of the time, 
they were found in these strip pit ponds. So this is from mining activity on the surface. Uh, and then oftentimes there's some mitigation or it fills in with some water. Those are the kinds of um, places that you can find beaver activity a lot of times. And then of course those more traditional um, habitats like streams, ponds, wetlands, and lakes. I will also add here that um, they have the option of a woody or an herbaceous vegetation. So woody, think forest, and herbaceous, think more like grasslands, um, softer material plants around. And they did actually prefer more of a woody habitat. So that makes sense because as I indicated before, they like to chew on trees. So let's talk about some of those behaviors, speaking of chewing on trees. Most of the time they're nocturnal. Um, this sort of switches a, a little bit more to a 24 hour uh, activity period in the late fall and early winter when they're starting to store up a bunch of uh, twigs and branches for food. Um, but most of the year they are sleeping during the daytime in their lodge and then they're more active at nighttime swimming around uh, looking for food sources. Colonies are very territorial. Um, so you can find these caster piles like this picture right here. It's just simply a small muddy pile. You might get some leaves and muck and debris in there. And what they're going to do is spray that castorium or that that uh, musky smell that I just briefly talked about that comes from underneath the uh, the tail. There's a couple glands there. They'll spray that onto this castor pile and that's marking their territory. It's also indicating that particular individual. So during mating season, uh, for example, it's telling other beaver who's around and what's going on, almost like a Facebook or something like that. Um, so they do create these small caster piles to mark their territory. They don't usually fight with other colonies. Um, they're very passive aggressive, so they, uh, they'll only fight a little bit during mating season. Um, but otherwise, they're just, you know, keeping everybody in check as far as that's concerned. Other behaviors would include building really important structures like dams, lodges, and bank dens. Uh, when I say really important, I mean that this uh, particular animal is a keystone species in its environment. A keystone species is an animal that if it is taken out of its environment, everything else is kind of relying on it to be there and so it all would fall apart. Um, and the reason why the key, excuse me, the reason why the beaver is a keystone species is because it creates and maintains wetlands. Wetlands are really important for all sorts of other animals. As you can see with some of these pictures, um, waterfowl and other birds rely on these wetlands for food and nesting resources. Um, amphibians and insects like the dragonfly and this bullfrog here uh, are also relying on the wetland as a nursery. So they're laying their eggs in the water and their young are growing up in this area. And then something that people don't necessarily think about is the plants that are um, growing up in this, this wetland that is being created as well. So here at Lake Hope, if you've ever been here before, especially in June, July, August, we have a whole bunch of absolutely gorgeous water lilies that are blooming on our lake. Um, so it's a really great time to get out there and see those. Um, but this is one particular um, plant that you might find growing in a beaver wetland. Wetlands in general, there's a lot of really important abiotic factors uh, that are being applied here. The, they slow the floodwaters. 
Um, so what is happening with that is the, the dam is creating this sort of stopping point for a lot of water. And as that water slows down, it's preventing erosion further downstream. And it's also giving that water a chance to be purified. So as that flood water sets there, uh, a bunch of that pollution that might be in there settles down into the silt or that muck and mud. And a lot of that is up taken into the plants and some plants are even able to purify and filter out heavy metals in a wetland. So this is really important for them to be there to be able to do that. Now, of course, uh, oftentimes beaver move on um, if there is not sufficient food supply in that area. So as they move to a different location, that dam is going to decay and then behind it, instead of a wetland, it starts to dry up and it becomes a meadow. And then you have a whole nother set of um, species of animals that are using it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's a picture of a dam that we have at Lake Hope along the Little Sandy Trail. And I am actually standing on the trail. So this is super close. So if you want to see beaver activity, head on to the Little Sandy Trail and check it out. This uh, particular structure is about four feet tall. And it's backing up an entire valley and creating this massive wetland behind it. This is another smaller dam that is being constructed um, on private property just uh, adjacent to the park. I'm standing on the roadway when I took this picture. So you can see again, very easy to see the beaver activity down here. And, and this particular dam is not really all that tall. It's maybe only a couple feet at that point off to the right hand side. Another structure that they create is their lodge. This is their house. And um, the house is going to be made of sticks and mud and muck, just like the dams are. Um, this one is again right on Little Sandy Trail, so you can see it really, really clearly. And, and this is a, a side note, because this one is so accessible, if you do see and are able to get up close to these beaver dams, please don't climb all over them. They're really, really sound structures, but of course, being a wild animal, you don't want to disturb them. So just continue walking along the trail, take a picture, stop, admire, uh, and then keep going. Just leave them alone. You probably won't even know if anybody's home, and if they have any indication that you're nearby anyway, they're going to leave the lodge and they'll be underwater and you'll never know where they're at. So you probably won't see them, especially during the daytime. So like I said, this lodge is created from a bunch of sticks, branches that they have collected from the forest surrounding them. Um, they will cut pieces uh, anywhere from a couple feet up to eight feet long and pile them around and seal all the cracks up with mud. Now, I've heard the rumor that a lot of um, beaver will carry that mud in their mouth, but they actually use their front paws for that. So, so they, uh, they're sealing that up with their paws. And this one had a lot of fresh mud to it. Now, the inside of the, the lodge um, is going to have one sort of central chamber here, just like this graphic is indicating. The, the chamber itself can be quite wide. It can measure up to eight feet wide and three feet tall. And the actual stick structure surrounding it can be several feet thick as well. There is a ventilation system at the top that allows fresh air to come in. And then there's usually one or two underwater entrances that help to protect the family inside. In the winter time, if you look to the left on this graphic, you can see there's a food pile that's sort of indicated there. That caching is almost like having a refrigerator on your front porch. So in the winter time, if you're feeling a little hungry, 
you don't have to go all the way to the grocery store. You can just go right outside to your front porch, grab a snack, take it back inside, nibble away. So they really, they have this whole uh, staying at home thing really under control. Now, as far as family life is concerned, the, the family or the colony consists of uh, mom and dad, and then that pair is monogamous. If they do lose a partner, they will remarry to kind of anthropomorphize that. They'll find another partner, but generally from year to year, they're going to stay with the same partner. Breeding is happening right now, January through March, and then um, anywhere from one to eight kits, generally around four, three or four are going to be born three months later in April through June. And these little fluff balls, they're so super cute. Look at them. They're, they're not very small, really. They come out and they're about a pound each, um, poor mama. But they are fully developed at birth and they can be swimming um, in the lodge in 24 hours. And within about a month, they're out exploring with mom. And I say mom because dad, after they're born, kind of disappears. Uh, and then once they're weaned and they're exploring, then he kind of comes back. So uh, he kind of does his own little bachelor thing for a, a little while there in between. And then those kits are going to stay with the family for uh, two years before they really get the hankering to go find their own territory and their own mates. So in one given year, you have mom, dad, you have last year's litter, and then you have this year's litter. So each colony consists of up to, you know, 10, roughly eight to 10 on average. The lifespan of the beaver is usually between seven and 10 years, uh, but there was a record setting 21 year old out in the wild. Um, and then of course in domestic situations, because they're not exposed to predators and diseases and things, um, that seven to 10 years can stretch a little bit. Hey Kaylin, we have a couple of questions. Sure. That, um, there's been a handful, but you've answered most of them, but I'll ask you just two that came in. Um, first, how quickly can a colony build a dam? Oh, super fast. <laughs> um, I've heard of people that, you know, have some issues with dams flooding property, and so they are trying to deconstruct or remove that dam to help keep the flooding situation under control. And it seems like almost overnight they're fixing this dam. They're very good at, at engineering those um, and very cognizant about water flow and water level. So I, I would say, um, you know, within a week you could probably get almost a full dam depending on the waterway, what that looks like and the amount of water that is being backed up. But yeah, they they are staying right on, on top of that for sure. Wow. Um, OK, and then we have Rick who asked a question. He says, overall, are beavers good or bad because of promoting erosion for Lake Hope? So for Lake Hope, um, we really, because it's a, an entirely forested park, um, we don't really have as much erosion issues um, where the beaver are themselves. Where we have erosion issues is uh, where the beaver wouldn't necessarily be able to get to, and it would be like a really, really intense rain situation. <laughs> um, so we don't necessarily have problems with them here at our park. Um, in general, though, depending on where they're at, uh, they are really great to have around. But like I indicated with the, the building of the dam question, sometimes they do become a nuisance as far as flooding or um, tree removal, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, because that's part of their diet, you know, some people don't like their trees being chewed down, which is understandable. Um, so it, it all depends on the individual situation. But as far as Lake Hope is concerned, we love them here. 
We don't typically have any issues with them. The only issues that we start to have is when they flood the main road, um, which is a state route, and ODOT gets involved with that. So they uh, they take out the dams, and we do on occasion have um, permitted trappers come in during the season and trap them out. So, so that's the only time is when they're flooding that main roadway that we have issue with them. Thank you. And just a reminder to our viewers, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A box, but I'll let you get back to your presentation, Kaylin. All right. Um, so as far as diet goes, what in particular part of the tree that they're eating is the outer bark and the inner cambium layer of the, the tree or the woody vegetation? So that cambium layer is where all the nutrients and the moisture are flowing up and down that plant. Um, and it's it's softer, that softer growth layer is what they are, are they're particularly eating. The inner heartwood, what you see that's left on the stump right here, um, they're not really interested in eating that. And really, they're only interested in eating smaller saplings most of the time, so five inches in diameter or smaller. That's really what they're going after as far as food resources. Um, if they are constructing something larger or they're caching more food, they may take down larger trees, um, but you're not gonna see that as often as you would the smaller saplings. A couple of their favorite flavors of trees are willows, maples, poplar, beech. Think about where they're at. They're in a, a floodplain area, so they're not going to hike clear up to the top of a ridge to chew on, you know, a post oak or something. They're going to be down lower in the floodplain, um, getting at different trees that are easier and that are already growing there. They also will chew on other um, aquatic vegetation, so lilies, water lilies, um, and water willow, things like that that are um, herbaceous, they're softer material that are available during the summertime. They'll also chew on that. And then as they're chewing, they're creating what is called beaver sign. So this would be um, like these pictures here, the pointed stump, you might see that stripped vegetation, that stark uh, white or cream colored sticks floating in the water. You also might see girdling of larger trees, and that just means they're chewing around the whole base of a tree um, and that that tree will die off eventually. So those are some different indications that uh, beaver are in the area. Now I do want to point out one other thing before I switch to the next slide. Um, the reason that these beaver can chew on all of this really hard woody vegetation with a bunch of cellulose in it and all that fiber is because they have a, a special cecum or a sac in between their large and small intestine that is chock full of microorganisms that can break down all of this fiber. So it's not normal for mammals to to eat all of this like really woody, heavy, fibrous vegetation. But the, again, as far as adaptations go, the beaver are just simply built to do this job. Um, we do have a couple predators of beaver. Most of the time they're going after the young, not necessarily the adult beaver. And here in Ohio, we do have a few of them, coyote, mink, uh, bobcats and river otter. Um, and then also throughout their range, they might also have um, wolves or fishers. Um, those would be other predators that they might have in North America, grizzly bears as well as black bears. But probably the biggest contributor um, or biggest predator to the beaver are humans. Um, we talked about, you know, mitigating some property damage as far as trapping goes. We talked historically about um, the beaver pelt and that castorium was so valuable. So humans have seen a need for beaver for a long time and, of course, uh, have been trapping them. 
not only do they get predated on by larger mammals, but they also get eaten up by smaller things too. So they do have specialized lice and fleas, beetles, roundworms um, that can survive in that fur, even underwater, and it can wreak havoc on their system. Um, and then also, rabies. That's not really a thing for beaver. Um, you'll find it in other mammals more readily, but that's not something that they necessarily have to worry about. All right, I believe my last slide here is a short little video and I hope it works. This is a beaver that uh, I caught on video. Again, I'm standing on the roadway. This was a flooded area and if you listen really closely, you can hear him chewing on some of this vegetation. So let, let's listen. Um, Kaylin, you probably have to reshare your slideshow for us to get sound and click. There's an audio button. Sorry. Ah, well, yeah. well, we'll just watch it then. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. So hopefully you can see me now. That's it, guys. That's the American beaver. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, Kaylin. Uh, that was Awesome. If anybody has any questions that you want to ask Kaylin before we wrap up, please do so. Um, I am just going to do a quick reminder of what we have coming down the pipeline uh, in terms of our webinars. So as I, if you weren't here at the beginning when I went over them, um, we do have some awesome webinars lined up for you all. Uh, next week, we're going to have Ohio's Woodpeckers with naturalist Julie Gee, who um, you met a little bit earlier today. That's going to be 10 a.m. on the 27th. And then um, the following week, Hibernation Fascination. That's going to be uh, pretty close to Groundhog Day, so you can find some more information out about groundhogs and hibernation during that webinar. Um, and we'll be talking about bobcats later in February and how to make uh, maple syrup. And then we have a Black History Month celebration um, series with some awesome, awesome webinars scheduled for that. We're going to be talking about the Underground Railroad on ODNR lands and um, Amer African American history in Ohio's Little Smokies. Um, if you don't know Ohio's Little Smokies, that's what uh, state officials promoted the area around Shawnee Hill, or excuse me, Shawnee State Park and Forest um, down in Southern Ohio. And um, there's there used to be all black CCC, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps camps down there that built roads, bridges, dams, and hiking trails um, to develop our, what we now know as our state parks and state forests. So please join uh, and I hope you all have a great week. Thanks. Bye.